Welcome. Thank you for joining us for our program. My name is Helen Liu, and I'm the Programming and Partnerships Manager at Cary Library. Before we begin, I'd like to take the moment to thank the Cary Library Foundation. Their support enables us to bring programs like today's event to you. I would also like to thank the libraries in Brookline, Canton, Needham, and Tewksbury for partnering with us on this program. This program is being recorded and would be posted to the library's YouTube channel. Per request of our speaker, the recording will remain on our channel for just six months. If you have any questions, please submit them to the Q&A or chat and Meredith will answer them at the end of the program. Tonight, Meredith Broussard, author of More Than a Glitch, Confronting Race, Gender, and Ability Bias in Tech, will discuss her book with Valerie Overton. Meredith Broussard is an associate professor at the Arthur L. Carter Journalism Institute of New York University and the research director at the NYU Alliance for Public Interest Technology. She is the author of More Than a Glitch, Confronting Race, Gender, and Ability Bias in Tech as well as the award-winning 2018 book, Artificial Unintelligence, How Computers Misunderstand the World. Her research focuses on artificial intelligence in investigative reporting with particular interests in AI ethics and using data analysis for social good. She appears in the Emmy-nominated documentary, Coded Bias, now streaming on Netflix. Her work has been supported by the Rockefeller Foundation, the Institute of Museum and Library Services, and the Tau Center at Columbia Journalism School. A former features editor at the Philadelphia Inquirer, she has also worked as a software developer at AT&T, Bell Labs, and the MIT Media Lab. Her features and essays have appeared in the New York Times, The Atlantic, Slate, Fox, and other outlets. Valerie Overton works at the intersection of public health, education, and IT, and has been a lifelong activist for civil rights and social justice. That background gives her a keen interest in Professor Meredith Broussard's book, More Than a Glitch. Welcome, Valerie, and welcome, Meredith. Thank you so much for having me. It's great to be here with you today. Uh, thank you, Helen, and, and thank you, Meredith, for joining us today. I uh, was just telling Meredith before we started that um, I was reading her book and then Helen invited me to have a conversation with Meredith and it's just such a pleasure to have an opportunity to engage in conversation with um, an author whose book I admire. So I'm really delighted to have this opportunity to talk with you, Meredith. Um, and, you know, as I was reading the book, More Than a Glitch, um, <laughs> uh, you know, I found that it is really packed with uh, with really a lot of examples of how technology um, that we think of as being so objective and so um, unerring, it, you know, can have really harsh consequences for people who don't fit kind of the norm, the quote unquote norm. Um, and there are just many, many examples. Um, and I really love how you make the, the storytelling about these examples and the storytelling about um, what you call techno chauvinism or what people in the field call techno chauvinism so accessible and real, which is such a skill because so many people don't do that well. <laughs> oh, thank you. So I guess, yeah, I guess I'd love to just start with that concept of uh, techno chauvinism. The and and you start by talking about kind of the difference between mathematical and social fairness, and how you know technology is really excellent at math, um, but it doesn't have a lot of insight when it comes to social logic or social fairness. And and um, so I'd love for you to just start by kind of talking about that distinction. And I know like the cookie example is such a fun. <laughs> well, should I tell the cookie example. story? So if, you wanna, if you wanna tell the, the cookie story as a way yeah. of kind of, of doing that, but yeah. yeah, yeah no, I'd be, I'd be happy to, I'd be happy to. Um, one of the things that I that I do in my work is I use a lot of domestic metaphors, uh, and that's that's deliberate. I think that we have spent too much time uh, 
you know, talking about technology in terms of, uh, in science fiction terms, and I would rather bring it down to the kind of everyday domestic level that uh, most people can understand. It's kind of a democratizing urge. Uh, and so I was thinking about the difference between mathematical fairness and social fairness. And I was thinking, all right, well, how would I, how would I explain this to a kid, and I realized that kids have an intuitive understanding of this because kids understand cookies, right? So mm -hmm. when I was a kid and there would be one cookie left in the cookie jar, my little brother and I would fight over who got the last cookie. And, you know, you there are a couple of ways to solve this, but if it were a word problem, right, like in a math textbook for an elementary schooler, uh, it would be very obvious how to solve the problem. You know, each child would get 50% of the cookie. And that is a mathematically fair solution. And that is also what a computer would say if you gave a computer this, uh, you know, this, uh, this math problem. And like, yes, that would be correct. But the thing is, in the real world, when you divide a cookie in half, you get a big half and a small half. And my brother and I would fight over who got which half of the cookie uh, because <laughs> we were kids. And so if I wanted the big half of the cookie, I would say to my brother, all right, you give me the big half of the cookie now and I will let you decide which TV show we watch after dinner. And my brother would think for a second and he would say, all right, that sounds fair. And it was, that was a socially fair decision. And so computers can only make mathematically fair decisions. Computers can only solve mathematical problems, which explains why we run into so many problems when we start trying to use computers to sort out social problems, because what's socially fair and what's mathematically fair or what is just, like these are not the same thing. And so we really need more nuance when we are talking about the role of technology in addressing social problems. Yeah, I love that story. And, you know, because it it really um, is a story that anyone can understand. Um, and, it, and it brings up kind of what I often hear is this idea that, well, with technology, you know, it can be objective, right? Mm. Um, and so, you know, there's fairness in, in the sense of objectivity, you know, it's not going to be swayed by this emotional argument or that emotional, you know, it's just going to be objective. Um, but it seems like, you know, that is such a myth because it's only objective to the extent that it is performing a mathematical operation as, as you just talked about it. But if it's being trained by data that are biased, then what kind of objectivity are we getting? You know, we're, we're uh, you know, it, it, the, the results might be mathematically reasonable based on the data that it's being trained on, but it's not being trained on data that represent, fully represent the entire population. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. And so, it, it, I guess that when I think about the examples in in your book, you talk about um, you know technology being used, kind of AI and um, you know big data, and, you know being used for really high stakes kind of issues around like law enforcement and mm -hmm. who's going to be targeted in law enforcement um, and medicine and diagnostic kind of considerations in medicine and education and predictive grading in education. Um, and those are all really high stakes where, um, you know, if if the AI or the technology is being uh, trained on, you know, with data that is not fully accurate or representative, then we're gonna have some really kind of potentially catastrophic results. And I wonder if you can like give some examples of how that, cause that's like very abstract, but you have some great examples of how that operates in real life. Well, I think to me, the example that I always uh, 
kind of that I think of first has to do with mortgage approval algorithms. So mm -hmm. I, I would recommend that everybody reads the markup, which is a terrific algorithmic accountability reporting organization. And there's a story in the markup from a couple of years ago where they investigated automated mortgage approval algorithms. And uh, they found bias. They found that these algorithms were 40 to 80% more likely to deny borrowers of color as opposed to their white counterparts. And then in some metro areas, this disparity was more than 250%, right? And that's huge. And a data scientist might look at this and say, oh, well, you know, the algorithm is just, is being objective. It's just deciding based on the math of who has been a good credit risk in the, in the past. But a sociologist might look at it and say, all right, I know exactly what's going on because uh, the algorithms are making biased discriminatory decisions, just like the biased and discriminatory financial decisions that have been made in the past. So if we think about how machine learning systems are made, it also becomes more clear. So the way that we make AI, right, or we make an AI uh, machine learning system is always the same. What we do is we take a whole bunch of data, we plunk it into the computer, and we say, computer, make a model. The computer makes a model, and the model shows the mathematical patterns in the data. And then we can do all kinds of amazing things with this model. We can use it to make predictions, to make decisions, to... Uh, generate new text or audio or video, right? That's what generative AI is. We've fed it millions and millions and millions of web pages, of scanned in books, of chat logs, et cetera. Uh, and then the model just reproduces the mathematical patterns that it sees in the data. So the mortgage approval algorithms were built the same way. What the banks did was they fed in data about who had gotten mortgages in the past. And then they said, all right, model, we want you to uh, find us more people like this who are uh, credit worthy. And so the sociological perspective on who's gotten mortgages in the past is informed by what we know about social problems in the United States. We know that there's a very long history of residential segregation. We know that there are things like redlining. We know there's financial discrimination. Uh, and we also know that home ownership is a major way of generational wealth building. And so by denying borrowers of color, these automated mortgage approval algorithms are, uh, are perpetuating uh, centuries of financial discrimination. So it is theoretically possible to put your finger on the scale to evaluate an algorithm and say, all right, well, this is uh, this is being biased against borrowers of color. I'm going to make it less biased in that regard. Uh, are enough people doing that? I don't think so. Yeah. And, you know, I, I think that to me, kind of the frightening thing is that, you know, these have big impacts on individual people's lives. They really you know, do. it's not just like this, you know, Oh, well, <laughs> you know, I mean, these have, you know, when you think about, um, you know, uh, people's wealth and financial well-being, when you think about law enforcement and, um, you know, kind of issues around facial recognition and um, or, you know, who, you know, areas that have been over policed then get even more over policed because the algorithms are telling you be telling them based on the data that that's where the policing is needed, you know? So, it, you know, it perpetuates, it, it perpetuates and expands. Yeah. Those like the, this was one of the things that made me, I, I was so mad writing the chapters about <laughs> predictive policing because I just, I kept reading these stories about police using technology and it, I, uh, it just, persecuting groups who are already over-policed. And so this, this idea of feedback loops in policing and predictive policing software was particularly, uh, particularly notable to me. So the way they build predictive policing software is they load in data about uh, where crimes have occurred in the past, and then they try to send police to those areas 
with the idea that, well, if crime has happened there in the past, then it's probably going to happen there in the future. But the thing is that crime data is not comprehensive. It's not crime data, it's arrest data, right? It shows who has been arrested for crimes, not who has committed crimes. And we know that black and brown and poor neighborhoods are already over-policed, right? So the data is showing that uh, you know, a bunch of arrests have been made in this area. And then you feed that back into the computer and the computer's like, oh, well, I'm going to send more police to this area where there was high crime. And so it becomes this really dangerous feedback loop. Um, also, the accuracy of these systems is, like, is for the most part garbage. Um, there was a story recently about a predictive policing system that was wrong 99% of the time, right? So these technologies are not at all robust and they are extraordinarily inaccurate, uh, especially for uh, people of color, uh, for trans and non-binary folks. And yet the police departments are spending enormous amounts of money on them. They're putting all of this faith into the computational systems. And we really should not be doing that. We should be doing uh, we should be investing less in these surveillance technologies and investing more in community-based solutions. Right. And, and that's kind of, you know, another really aggravating point that makes is very clear in your book that, you know, you're spending just vast amounts of, of money in police departments and also, edu you know, educational institutions and, you know, lots of different uh, institutions are spending all this money on systems that are really not effective, not effective at all, or, you know, or very effective in perpetuating um, disparities, <laughs> which, mm -hmm. is, which is really sad. Um, and, you know, I, I think that, um, you know, one of the themes that you talk about is, um, you know, if you're going to use, if you're going to develop these kinds of systems, then, you know, you really need to look at your data set and um, that you're used to training, to train the systems on and see, you know, how representative, um, uh, robust, you know, are these, are these data sets. And also kind of just, you know, think you you also provide examples um, around people with disabilities. And, you know, I, I'm hard of hearing myself. And so I have relied on technology um, a, a lot. And particularly, I mean, the pandemic was great for me in a lot of ways because, you know, it kind of greatly expanded the use of captions on, on meetings, which has been a huge help for me. Mm -hmm. um, so there are ways in which this has been hugely helpful, and yet, um, you know, there are just mind-bogglingly basic kind of omissions in the design process based on who is not there in the design process. So you talk about the idea of universal design, and I, I wonder, like, if you can talk a little bit about, like, who you need to be present in order for universal design to be even possible, let alone successful. Well, I'm I'm so glad you brought this up. Uh, and disability was uh, something that I had to learn a lot about uh, in order to write this book. I'm really grateful to uh, the experts and the regular folks who shared their experiences with me and helped me to learn. Uh, going into the project, I felt like I knew I. I knew a bunch about race and gender, but I did not know enough about disability. So I'm really grateful that I had the opportunity. And I I, I was particularly struck by one story that I heard um, of uh, Richard Dan, uh, who's deaf and worked at a an Apple store in Maryland. And he had asked for a translator. Um, he had asked for a, an ASL translator to, uh, to come to a meeting because uh, it was very difficult for him to hear what was going on in the meeting. And his manager had assigned a coworker to take notes for him in the meeting, which sometimes works, 
right? I, you know, it is absolutely a useful accommodation to have a scribe uh, typing notes. That's what we do often uh, when I, uh, you know, when there's a deaf student in one of my classes, uh, we get a scribe, the scribe comes and takes notes and, you know, it works really well, but it doesn't work well when it's a coworker who also has to pay attention and contribute in the meeting. So in this particular case, uh, Richard said that, you know, the coworker was just not taking notes fast enough and he was just, he was missing information. And what he felt like was he felt like the company uh, kept pushing him to use technology, that they wanted their technology to, to be a complete accommodation for him. And mm -hmm. he was trying to make the point that, yeah, the technology is really great until you hit the outer limits of it, right? So you can't use speech to text uh, on an iPad in a room where you've got multiple conversations happening at one time because the the speaker doesn't know, like the, the computer speaker doesn't know which, mm -hmm. her microphone doesn't know which of the conversations to pick up, right? Or if you're in a room that's not properly amplified, well, then the microphone is not going to pick up the speaker and you're not going to be able to use speech to text, right? So technology is so great for expanding access until it isn't, right? And mm -hmm. the way that we know what still needs to be done is we need to listen to people. Like we need to listen to people like Richard who say, you know, this environment is is just not conducive to being able to use technological accommodations. I need a human uh, accommodation in this particular instance. And we need to say, okay, that makes a lot of sense. We need to listen to people. Yeah, yeah. And that, you know, that what, that's part of what strikes me about a lot of um, the examples in, in your book also where, you know, because those people weren't present in the design process, you know, it, you know, the output, the product reflects the experiences and perspectives of the people who were part of the design process. Mm -hmm. And if that historically has been primarily, you know, cis, typically able white men, then you're missing a lot of experiences and perspectives and the the output and the product is not going to be meaningful, you know, in yeah. a lot of cases to to other kinds of people. And um, it, you know, it, and that seems like a real challenge in in the in the process of you know building technological solutions. It's like how you know if you don't have a highly diverse and inclusive team. How are you going to overcome that, um, it, you know, in, in trying to design or build a solution? Absolutely. Absolutely. I mean, it's having diversity on the team, I think, that is key uh, because none of us can know everything and we all have unconscious bias. You know, we're all trying to become better people every day, but we have unconscious mm -hmm. bias and then we embed our unconscious bias in the technology that we create and we can't see it because it's unconscious, right? So if we have diversity on our team, if we empower uh, the people on our team to be heard, right, to speak up and to be heard and, you know, for their, like, we need to pay attention to uh, different perspectives and not just dismiss them as, you know, edge cases. Uh, that's the way that we can uh, effectively combat unconscious bias. Uh, Silicon Valley still has a diversity problem, though. There are lots of individual teams I know who are working hard on the diversity problem, but the industry writ large still has significant issues with diversity. Yeah, yeah, it's it's a real challenge. Um, as Helen said, I kind of work at the intersection of public health and education and IT and, you know, diversity, equity, inclusion and justice. And, um, it, you know, even just trying to bring in good accessibility principles can be <laughs> a challenge, you know, let alone 
all of the different perspectives that are needed. Um, mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. And, you know, I, I think that kind of, you know, brings us kind of to like the need for, um, well, it, you know, kind of pilot testing and, and you know, kind of a, a more inclusive testing process, but also, you know, once, you know, if you haven't been able to be inclusive in the design and development process, then your product is likely to have some biases embedded in it, even unintentionally. Like, right, I mean, I think that you say frequently that often, usually, this is not malicious, this is unintentional because of un unconscious biases, which is where you get into kind of the algorithmic accountability kind of idea, which, um, you know, I, 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 you know, I really love kind of the, the line that you kind of put in there about how, you know, investors invest tons of money in innovation and developing new things, um, but not a lot of money into um, auditing or understanding kind of the, you know, the potential challenges or issues or disparities that are part of the outcomes of existing products. And that's where, you know, accountability, algorithmic accountability doesn't get a lot of play, you know, in, <laughs> in the marketing yeah, world. I wish, I wish world. algorithmic accountability were a little more sexy, right? Because uh, looking for bias is not, uh, you know, it's not at the top of most people's agenda. Uh, I think it's also, uh, it's also so hard to admit that after you've invested thousands and thousands of dollars in something that it might be flawed, right? Because yeah. you just have to work so hard to make a new technology system, to get people to adopt a new technology system. There's kind of this, this forced positivity to it. Like you just have to be such a cheerleader that people are reluctant to admit that, oh yeah, there's kind of a big problem in this and we, you know, have been ignoring it for a long time. Uh, but that is, that is the reality of it. And lawyers, I think, are starting to, uh, are starting to figure this out. Uh, and the really savvy lawyers have realized that, uh, well, if we're using an algorithmic system, it is probably discriminating and it is better to audit our system, identify the discrimination and uh, and remediate it uh, mm -hmm. before, you know, some regulatory agency comes after us because the regulatory agencies are coming like they mm -hmm. they are staffing up and uh like they are getting more tech savvy, like tech regulation is coming. Uh, one of the things that I, I, one of the frames that I use uh, that I rely on comes to Ruha Benjamin's book, Race After Technology, which is a fantastic book, recommend it to everybody. Um, and this is the idea, technological systems or automated systems uh, discriminate by default. I found this so helpful because for so long, there's been this techno chauvinist notion that computers are objective or neutral or unbiased. And uh, that's it's simply not the case. It's simply not true, right? So if we expect to find algorithmic bias, we're more primed to see it when it inevitably occurs. And we can also be more proactive about going and seeking it out and thus eliminating it. But these are hard conversations to have. Yeah, yeah. I, you know, I really was interested in some of the ideas that you had about how to go about yeah, well, for I mean, it might not be obvious to everybody what algorithmic accountability is or what algorithmic auditing is. So it might be helpful for you to talk about that and kind of what the approaches are, because I was really interested in some of the approaches about like, you know, creating a matrix and of all different kinds of traits and all different kinds of people. And, you know, where might people, you know, where might the system be failing? 
Mm-hmm. So mm-hmm. maybe, you know, oh, yeah. so I can, about- I can definitely do some definitions. Yeah. So algorithmic accountability uh, is the type of reporting that I do. Uh, so traditionally the media, like one of our roles has been to hold power to account. And in a world where algorithms are increasingly being used to make decisions on our behalf, that accountability function has to transfer onto algorithms and their makers, right? So I do algorithmic accountability reporting. Uh, You can, and one of the tools that we do as algorithmic accountability reporters, one of the tools we use is called algorithmic auditing. And this means opening up the black box of an algorithm. People do often refer to algorithms as black boxes. And when you do that, it kind of makes them abstract and impenetrable. And you can kind of pretend that nobody knows what's happening inside. But honestly, we know a couple of things about what's happening inside. Like we have done a lot of research on explainability. And so it is entirely possible to to look at what's happening inside an algorithm discover the different weights that given to different features. And uh, and then we can use some newer mathematical methods to uh, identify and, uh, and perhaps eliminate bias, right? But the big idea here is that uh, you can look at what goes into the algorithm. You can look um, what comes out of the algorithm and you can reverse engineer what's happening inside the algorithm as a result, mm-hmm. right? Uh, So that's what we do as journalists. Uh, If you are, that's called an external audit. You can also do an internal audit. So if you're inside a company, then you have access to the training data, you have access to the outputs, and you have access to the code and the model and the documentation. So you can do an internal audit. It's even easier to figure out what's going on inside uh, the algorithm when you can read the code. Right. As journalists, we can rarely read the code, but uh, inside a company, you can just read the code and you can figure out what's going on. Uh, It's completely straightforward. Uh, So this is algorithmic auditing, and this is the mechanism uh, by which you can uh, identify bias in an algorithm. But if you're not a coder, you can also look for bias in algorithms. So there have been some really great stories done lately about generative AI and the ways that generative AI is biased. I particularly like a story from Bloomberg where the reporters uh, went in and asked, uh, I think it was Stable Diffusion, uh, the uh, AI image generator, to uh, show them thousands of pictures of a doctor thousands of pictures of a nurse, thousands of pictures of a CEO of a dishwasher. And in the, uh, in the AI world, uh, doctors are white men, nurses are women, people who wash dishes are black women, uh, CEOs are white men. So these, these image generators are based on, or are trafficking in stereotypes which makes sense when we uh, think about how machine learning systems work, right? Because we've got a model, Mm -hmm. model shows mathematical patterns in the data, and then it's predicting uh, what arrangement of pixels you're going to want to see. And it's predicting that based on what it sees in the data. Well, the most common things it sees sees in the data are stereotypes. And so it's going to predict the most likely uh, most statistically likely image, right? Mm-hmm. That is not, it's not progressive. Uh, it's not good. It's what's popular, right? So computers can't autonomously just dis- determine what is good. They can only determine what is popular. And so popular is often a proxy for good. Right, wherein lies the problem? Yeah, <laughs> um, yeah. I mean, because you know, you think about you know uh, Gen AI, and um, it, you know, and I know so many people who are so excited about it, and and for good reason. You know, I mean, it is kind of the idea, the concept is is exciting, um, and you know, when you look at 
the volume of content that's out there and who is represented in what ways in that content, you know, it's also kind of worrisome. And, you know, I, I was just, I was even um, looking at, you know, developing some training, you know, some equity centered public health training and, um, and uh, using kind of online uh, modules and, you know, with visuals and whatnot. And, you know, just kind of doing the search and, you know, even thinking about using AI to kind of come up with you know, images and things like that, it is really disturbing <laughs> to see yeah. that, you know, just in, in, in my, uh, you know, efforts to see how much of the images are stereotypical yeah. um, that you yeah. go back and that's pretty disconcerting when you think it about really is. It really is. being used. Yeah, you, well, yeah. I mean, you can also do, like I really encourage people to use generative AI because it's really nifty for like 10 minutes, right? And mm -hmm. then I also encourage people to do your own auditing, like go in and ask for, you know, images of people who blah, 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 right? Yeah. Uh, and you'll very quickly see that uh, these systems do not they're not inclusive they do not uh rep they do not generate uh diverse images like the only level of diversity that you might get is you might get a variation in skin tones uh if you get you know five images at once of uh a person uh and i haven't tested it for images of people with disabilities but i am gonna guess that it's just not that good at representing them. No, no, you know, and, and I think that, you know, a challenge with people with disabilities and, you know, representation is that disabilities is, you know, a lot of times people think of disabilities as being mobility, right? You know, mm -hmm. using a wheelchair and, um, you know, disability is a hugely uh, varied, kind of group of, mm -hmm. of circumstances and you know that's just not well represented as right. well and the same thing with gender you know I mean you alluded to kind of CEOs being coming back as like white men um, and that's just within the gender binary let alone <laughs> exactly exactly most, most computational systems really do rely on the gender binary like they're they're not set up to uh to show gender as a spectrum which is you know a very 1950s concept of gender and we have a more expansive concept of gender now uh but our computational systems are still relying on this 1950s idea about gender yeah yeah very one much of so. the things that i've found very helpful is uh is the idea that there's no one size fits all approach to disability uh, and mm -hmm. so I think about this often, and I also think about this in the context of writing computer code, right? Because what programmers are taught is we're taught uh, to write code that covers the greatest number of situations that you can think of. And then everything that doesn't fall into that is an edge case. And mm -hmm. you'll solve for the edge case later. You just solved for the majority case first, but then mm -hmm. nobody ever goes back and solves for the edge cases, like, unless you're kind of forced to, because, you know, it's, it's kind of like going back and like cleaning up. Like if you just like cut through some wood and there's a little sawdust all over the floor, like, do you immediately go and clean up? And like, if nobody's coming after you to like check if you're cleaning up, you, you're not going to clean up. Right. So Disability gets treated as an edge case, which is, uh, I mean, that's not appropriate. It's people's lives, right? Right, right. Yeah. I mean, you know, unfortunately, you know, race and gender and a lot of other faith, lots of, lots of other things are treated as edge cases as well. Right, right. Which is <laughs> also outrageous. It is, it is. Um, you know, I, 
I was curious, uh, in your book, you talk about um, that you're kind of working on a, a project to develop a, a tool called Pilot, you know, based on kind of the regulatory sandbox idea. And I was kind of intrigued um, to learn a little bit more about that. Like, can you tell us a little more about kind of what what you're working on with that? Sure. So that is a project that I worked on uh, with uh, Kathy O'Neill, uh, who's the author of Weapons of Math Destruction and a Lexington native. Uh, Kathy has a consulting firm called Orca, O'Neill Risk Consulting Associates, uh, Risk Consulting and Algorithmic Auditing. Uh, and uh, what Pilot is, is it's a platform for algorithmic auditing. Uh, so up to this point, people have mostly been doing bespoke algorithmic auditing. So we've been doing one-offs and we've been kind of building things artisanally, right? And we're going to need to scale up uh, eventually because more and more people are understanding that algorithmic auditing is something that should be integrated into your regular business processes. And so I, I, I don't know, I like building computer systems. So I, I worked with uh, Kathy and her team to systematize their approach to algorithmic auditing and build a platform uh, where you can uh, kind of feed in data and uh, Pilot will uh, evaluate the bias and then you can, uh, you can remediate it. Yeah, I mean, it seems like such a, an important and needed tool because, it, you know, I think for most people, uh, um, you know, most people just don't have any uh, any way of, it, it, it is kind of, for most people, you know, it's that black box concept. Mm -hmm. It's just like some sort of magic in there, you know, right. <laughs> and it's just, you know, completely abstract and and unavailable. Um, and so like, we really need people who will um, kind of system systematize these processes so that they are done more routinely and more regularly. Um, so yeah, I thank you for, for working on that. Um, I, I, you know, I noticed that we do have a, a question in, the um, Q and A feature, and uh, it reminds me of some of the, um, you know, some of the stories that you have about education in your book. So it's definitely worth reading to to uh, learn about some of those stories about AI, the impacts of AI in education. But the question is, how might AI impact equity in education, and how can schools effectively incorporate AI in the classroom and in learning? without further exacerbating equity gaps? What should parents and caregivers uh, look out for? All right, this is a lot of, uh, this is a lot of questions. <laughs> I will take them one by one. Uh, so how might AI impact equity in education? Uh, it is likely going to be, it's likely going to negatively impact equity in education unless we are extremely careful about how we deploy artificial intelligence. And I, we need to not rely on it too much, especially for high stakes decisions. Uh, so I tell a story in the book about uh, a situation in uh, during the pandemic when the International Baccalaureate Program, which is this very prestigious uh, secondary school diploma, it's an international program, the uh, usually IB uh, runs exams at the end of the year. And mm -hmm. if you score well enough on your IB exams, uh, then depending on where you go to college, you can get college credit. You know, for scoring well in your exam, for doing well on your, you know, in your IB classes. Um, and in some cases, you can get up to two years of college credit, which is an enormous, enormous, uh, you know, enormous benefit, uh, especially for kids whose families struggle to pay for college. So I uh, met a young woman named Isabel Castaneda, uh, who was 
in IB and was a heritage Spanish speaker, uh, was getting all A's in all of her classes and uh, IB because, and suddenly, you know, school shut down and Isabel and her, uh, all of her classmates and, you know, all of the kids in the country suddenly couldn't take the IB exams in person, right? So international baccalaureate, instead of, uh, you know, a range of other options decided they were going to use an algorithm to predict the grades that the students would have gotten if they had taken the standard, the IB exams that did not occur, right? So they used an algorithm to generate imaginary grades for real students. Isabel, who was, a, as I said, a straight A student, uh, you know, fluent in Spanish, the algorithm predicted that she would fail her Spanish exam, which is completely, completely outrageous. And uh, I looked at what was going on and I very quickly realized, oh, this is because the algorithm has been fed with uh, data about uh, how students have done in the past, right? And there is a very close correlation between I, uh, you know, uh, economic position and grades. Wealthy kids mm -hmm. do better in school than poor kids. I, uh, rich schools, the students do better. Poor schools, the students do worse. And so right. this, this is, is at the population level. Yeah, at a population level, like broadly speaking, yeah. like this is what the yeah. algorithm identified. Like those are the patterns yeah. in education data. And so Isabel went to a poor school. And so it predicted that she was going to do badly. Now, this is exactly the opposite of what we hope is happening with education. We hope that education is uh, providing people with a, you know, with a uh, ladder upwards economically. Uh, we hope that education is about your individual achievement, not uh, some kind of predetermined status based on uh, where you had the fortune or misfortune to be born, right? And the algorithm doesn't see any of that. Like the algorithm has no mm -hmm. shame about the the way that the American education system is working and how there's this massive inequality. It just says, all right, well, we think the poor kids are going to continue to fail. We think the rich kids are going to continue to succeed. And that's how we're going to uh, allocate the grades. And Isabel uh, managed to successfully argue uh, that the, I, the IB exam prediction was wrong, did manage to get co the college credit that she deserved. I'm so thrilled that she managed to do this, but uh, we should not be putting high school students in this kind of situation where they have to argue against algorithmic decisions, right? We should not be using AI systems when we know that they're going to be biased. There are other cases of AI systems where people are trying to use them to uh, do screening of kids uh, mm -hmm. going into schools. Those are mostly biased based on skin tone, so they misidentify uh, kids of color more often or uh, are going to you know, identify them as potentially carrying a weapon more often than kids with lighter skin. Like, it's just it's terrible. So that's the way it's going to exacerbate inequality in education. How can you do it well? Mm, well, uh, most of the time you can not use AI uh, and we need to fund our schools better. We need to pay our teachers better. We need to have more money for uh, for books, for classroom supplies, for air conditioning. Uh, you can't use computers in a lot of schools uh, because there's no air conditioning and it's too hot for the computers to function. Uh, a lot of schools have uh, out of date electrical systems, so you can't like have a laptop cart that you plug in because it takes too much power and it'll blow out the uh, blow out the fuses in the school. I mean, these are these are not sexy problems. These are not problems that VCs are lining up to solve. Uh, you know, nobody gets excited about replacing the electrical, but 
it's super necessary. You know, we can't do AI in schools without decent electrical and air conditioning and, you know, soap and toilet paper. Right, right. And and that kind of, I think, goes to another kind of theme that runs in your book is that, you know, the solution isn't always technology. <laughs> yeah. You know, there are all kinds of, of, of places where, you know, situations where technology might be useful if it's done well um, and with a minimum of bias. But there are also places where the solution just isn't technology. Yeah. Um, it, you know, and and I think that, you know, you're pointing out, you know, those situations where we're just not, you know, you know, shipping a bunch of um, iPads or laptops or whatever is not going to help the child's education or, or yeah. you know, in, in, in that school. So, yeah. Um, yeah. Um, you know, and, you know, I think about Christina's uh, question about, you know, using, you know, incorporating AI in the classroom itself. And, you know, and, and to me, it sounds like I, I'm wondering kind of what your take on this, because to me, if, if we're thinking about, you know, educators inviting children to explore kind of the use of AI, you know, a lot of that would just need to be uh, focused on developing those critical thinking skills about what the AI is sourcing from and what the AI outputs are and understanding that. I, I wonder what kind of what your thoughts are about that. Well, I I had the uh, the great good fortune of being a uh, a visiting scholar at the Agnes Irwin School outside of Philadelphia last year, which is a K through twelve girls school, uh, and I decided that I was going to do uh, a lesson for the girls about artificial intelligence. So I was going to gear it to the different age levels, and I it turns out that explaining AI to uh, to pre-K kids uh, is really a pretty big challenge because they're, you know, they're still kind of struggling with like what's left and what's right, you know? So, <laughs> so really like talking to kids about artificial intelligence depends on how ready the kids are. Uh, yeah. You know, yes, like small children can figure out how to use an iPad or a phone. Like that is really easy. And AI is hard and, you know, you just have to be, you have to be ready and prepared to learn a hard thing, right? Because AI is math. It's very complicated, beautiful math. And often, like nowadays, we have these very sleek interfaces that make it look like it's not math, but it's actually still math, right? Uh, and uh, so it kind of depends on... Uh, the age and stage and preparation of the kids mm -hmm. and critical thinking skills are uh, essential. Um, I actually just taught a uh, taught a lesson about AI today uh, to my graduate students. Um, we were using uh, the uh, generative AI feature inside an image editing program, and we had a lot of fun because you. Uh, you type into a box what you want it to make a picture of, and then it makes a picture of that thing. And it's like, oh, mm -hmm. this is great. And then, you know, we had a little competition to see like who could make the weirdest image. And they were all really weird looking because, you know, the technology is not that robust. Uh, and so it was a lot of fun, again, for like 10 minutes because you very quickly like see the limitations of these mm -hmm. things. Uh, AI, uh, generative AI specifically, is uh, is very useful for things you don't already know how to do. It'll give you an incredibly mediocre version of the thing you don't know how to do, and sometimes that's enough. And if you are already an expert in something, in drawing or in writing, then it'll give you a mediocre version, and you'll think to yourself, oh yeah. I could, I could do a better job and then you'll go mm -hmm. and do a better job, you know, which is, which is fine. 
you know, sometimes we all need a kick in the pants to get started. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. I, I've heard some people talk about using it, you know, to kind of overcome writer's block, you know, <laughs> to, yep. you know, if you're doing I, research I have and, absolutely and done that. And I, I ask, you know, chat GPT or whatever, like to write the thing that I don't want to write. And then I look at it and I think, oh yeah, that's garbage. I know how to write this thing. And then I write it. <laughs> Yeah. I mean, is yeah. that worth millions and millions of dollars and all of the environmental impact? No, but, you know, there we have it. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Very high tech little prod <laughs> or mm -hmm. prompt for you. <laughs> yeah. Um, yeah, so it, there's another uh, question. Um, it says, how can you minimize unconscious bias? And I'm assuming that's kind of in the context of, of, you know, in tech and, you know, in these, whether it's Gen AI or other technology systems that rely on enormous sets of data that are often flawed. <laughs> um, yes. Uh, I wonder what your thoughts are about kind of just overcoming or managing kind of um, unconscious bias in, in this, you know, in this world. Well, my my best strategies for uh, minimizing unconscious bias are are in the technology realm, uh, and there are two things I think we can do. Uh, well, a couple of things. Uh, one is we can have a diverse range of people in the room, and we can listen mm -hmm. to them. Right? We don't need to all know everything, but we do need to listen to other people who are telling us about their perspectives. Um, and the other thing we can do is we can look for known biases, right? So we, you know, you can go to Wikipedia and you can look up a list of cognitive biases. Like you can, mm -hmm. uh, we, we know that there are concrete biases like financial discrimination or uh, racial bias or gender bias. Uh, you can start with the kinds of bias that are illegal for example. Mm -hmm. um, so in hiring uh, hiring systems, for example, it is illegal to discriminate in hiring based on race, gender, uh, disability, uh, you know, marital status, uh, age, right? So start with the things that are illegal and look for how might your system be discriminating based on this. And then you know, then address it, right? If you don't have enough pictures of uh, of people with a variety of skin tones in your training data for your facial recognition system, then, you know, fix it. If you don't have people uh, of a range of ages showing up as suggested uh, candidates for a job, you have a problem, right? So, mm -hmm. you know, start by looking at the obvious, looking for the obvious stuff and you'll find it. Great. Well, I feel like I could um, keep asking you questions for another hour. <laughs> I have lots and lots of, uh, um, you know, just reading your book was a joy, a pleasure, uh, you know, uh, because you, you do kind of just really beautifully describe this world and kind of um, the examples that you give and the stories that you tell are just really meaningful. So um, I do encourage folks who haven't read it to, to go out and read it. Um, but I do want to be respectful of your time and not ask you to uh, <laughs> just stay on well, for uh, an extra hour. <laughs> yeah. Well, Valerie, thank you so much. Really enjoyed this conversation. Uh, and it's been so great being with all of you this evening. Thank you. Thank you so much, yeah. Meredith, for joining us this evening for such an interesting conversation. And thank you, Valerie, for moderating. All thank right. you again. Thank you so much. Good night. Good night, everyone. Right. Thanks thank for coming. You.